Green meant go. The field was prime. The action was fast, sometimes too close. There was a sea of color. Some saw red. Everyone wanted to be top dog, while others got bit. That was Lakeland. Now it's Bradenton and the Hooters Cup Series. the DeSoto Speedway in Bradenton, Florida. It's round number two of the Hooters Cup Series for 1996. Hello, everybody. Mark Allen here. Happy you're joining us for another round of Hooters Cup action, the Hooter A200. We're expecting a great race here tonight at DeSoto Speedway for a variety of reasons, one of which is this is a home track for a lot of drivers over the years. Some of them cut their teeth here. Others have won track championships. And we think there's at least a dozen drivers with a chance to win here tonight. And joining me once again is Bill Hennessy. And Bill, one of the big stories we'll also be following tonight is a great big payout, not only in tonight's race, but in the series first for the end of the season. You would think there was a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, and the rainbow ends right here in the Hooters Cup Series. Taking a look at $15,000 for the winner, which is the major portion of the prize money for the man that takes the checkered flag. He's also capable of picking up two bonuses, $1,000 for a pole, $1,000 for leading halfway. But you think, hey, that's not a lot of money. Second place pays $7,500. The total purse tonight, $75,000. And when you take a look at the season ending pot of gold, it's over a half million dollars with the winner of the championship taking away $110,000 plus. It's very profitable to go short track racing on a Saturday night. And if this race is anything like the season opener in Lakeland back in February, we're expecting a heck of a show tonight. Here's a look back at that event. Flag and the chase 85 drivers showed underway. for 40 starting spots in the season opening now race at Lakeland. Freddie Quarry was the pole sitter the and early pace setter. Mike Garvey wanted his turn on the point and took it on lap 17. The night's biggest melee erased five cars on the spot before mid-race. Mario Goslin's in front passed halfway until he crashed with a lapped car. Down the stretch, many had to hang on. But in the end, it was a water meter reader from Battle Creek, Michigan, Fred Campbell, who claimed the first $15,000 check of the season. Doug Rice is down in. Fred, you had to have doubts there. It looked like Dave Fletcher pretty much had this thing sewed up, and then he ran into some trouble, and you were able to inherit the win and the, uh, the lead in the win. Yeah, he was running awful good. Uh, we needed the long, the long greens really helped us, and... Uh, he had a motor problem or whatever, and that's what we needed to get to the front. It has to be a good feeling. You come in here from Battle Creek, Michigan. Fred has a, a job that you don't usually associate with race car drivers. Fred repairs water meters for the city of Battle Creek, Michigan. And in here today, you drive this thing to the front. Yeah, the car is awful good. I have to thank uh, Harley Bovey from Port City Racing. Uh, his chassis and his motor, he put a wonderful car under me, and without him, we never could have done it. All right, Fred, well, why don't they... Let's go on over here and join the folks in front of the big Hooters banner here and celebrate your victory. John, I hope you was watching, buddy. All right, so there's uh, Fred Campbell, and he's going to squeeze in there. And that, <laughs> you can see right behind Fred. Fred, we're going to get you to move here. They have the Hooters girl, and I think they've got an interloper in here. That's actually Vince Gelati, and uh, you've probably seen Vince some on some of the national commercials for Hooters, and I think there was a full-page ad in USA Today that featured Vince, and uh, he, he's a... Uh, the Hooters boy, I think you're aware of the campaign to hire men as Hooters girls, and maybe that's a good reason why they should never actually do that. Fred Campbell now picks up a $15,000 check, and he wins his first Hooters Cup victory here tonight and only the third Hooters Cup race of his career. He had a second up at Toledo last year, and uh, you probably have to repair a lot of water meters up in Battle Creek to pick up $15,000. And it is a terrific night for racing here. Weather conditions are delightful. We'll be back to set the starting field and drop the green right after this. Tonight's telecast of the Hooter A200 is brought to you by Hooters, a delightfully tacky restaurant. 
by Hooter Aid, the drink that puts something back. By Jackaroo, if you ain't got Jackaroo, you ain't got Jack. By naturally fresh water, naturally fresh, naturally pure spring water. By naturally fresh foods, taste the difference. And by Red Dog Beer. And let's take a look now at the starting field for tonight's race. 200 laps around DeSoto Speedway, a 3 8 mile facility. Qualifying ended just about an hour and a half ago. They were qualifying the last chance and provisional positions just up to airtime. So bear with us here. We're going to get you the starting grid, all your favorite drivers in tonight's field. On the front row, the pole sitter, first time in the series, Jerry McCart. Next to him will be Mario Goslin. On row two, it will be Billy Bigley Jr. and Rich Bickle. On the inside of row number three, Matt Kenseth. And as you look at the rest of the top ten, let's take a continuation through the field. 28 drivers will go for the green around the 3 8 mile speedway. John Crow will be 11th, Hal Goodson 12th, Rick Crawford 13th, Dave Plitcher 14th, and Freddie Quarry 15th. 16th, it's Ronnie Sanders, then Daryl Shelnut, Mike Franklin, Mike Garvey, and Scott Walters. These were the drivers who locked in on qualifying. Then we went to the last chance race, and from that event, Dwayne Dempsey, Jody Ridley, Randy Renfro, and Randy Fox advanced to the feature. And then provisional starters, Russell Bearden, Derek Kelly, David Jude, and Daniel Keene will bring up the rear of the field. We are one lap from going racing. Great-looking field of cars, Mark. These cars coming in here, over 50 of them came to race here to go for the big purse that, of course, we told you about a little bit earlier. $15,000 going to the winner, Jerry McCart. First ever race in the Hooters Cup Series. Wins the pole and the $1,000 posted by Discount Auto Parts. Green flag, ready to wave. And the chase for $75,000 is underway and a little metal scrape right from the start as Jerry McCart exerts the position and gets out front. Mario Goslin sitting in the second spot. We got through turn one and two clean. Three and four will be the same way as we complete lap number one. Well, McCart has some bragging rights now, Mike. He led the very first lap ever in competition in Hooters Cup racing here at Brayton, Florida's DeSoto Speedway. It looks like he's starting to pull away from everyone. Goslin will continue second. The car on the outside of him is the green 45 of Rich Bickle. We'll follow that story more. But Jerry McCart, a bit of a surprise to everybody, turning a lap of 14.1596, thousandths of a second quicker than Goslin, who won the fall race here at DeSoto Speedway last season. Top 20 qualifiers, Mark, separated by less than 3.5 tenths of a second. And now second place is about to change hands. Bickle gets it. Rich Bickle now up into the second position over Mario Goslin. The 32 is Dirk Stevens, a good qualifying run. Billy Bigley is the 28 car. Then the, the blue and white 53 is Scott Hansen. Inside of him is the gray 68 of Matt Kenseth. We'll be calling car numbers out for you in colors as you get familiar with these Hooters Cup late model drivers. Two by two, they roll off that second quarter. Finally, Billy Bigley is able to pull to the third place. Look at Dirk Stevens there. Dirk having quite a run battling with Matt Kenseth, the driver that towed 23 hours just to be here. And Kenseth has done well in every form of late model racing he's performed in so far over the last couple of years. A very young driver, only 24 years of age. Whoa, Dirk Stevens from Water, Washington had a look at a rear view mirror and saw Matt Kenseth just about go around. It's single file through the top 20 positions at this point as everybody is settling down. We've got 200 laps of action around the speedway. We will have a mid-race break. You may have noticed that there are no pits in the infield here. The pits are outside the backstretch. So at lap 100, they'll throw a mandatory yellow. We'll take a seven-minute break, at which time the teams can go into the back pits, make the necessary adjustments, change to fresh rubber, and then come back out for the final 100 circuits. A lot of family further back in the pack. And in the taking place here early in the going, it's really to no avail, even though Richie Bickle has pulled up right to the rear heels now of the leader. Both of those cars are built by Richie Bickle. Those are RBR racing chassis. And Matt
Brad Kenseth, who did well in the season opening race, also did well in the season opening uh, off-pro race before being disqualified for a uh, an oversized carburetor, uh, is having a good run here tonight in the top six. Matt Kenseth is a young man who's got a bright future in this series, but Jerry McCart, a driver that a lot of people don't know a whole lot about from Stockbridge, Georgia, so far is keeping a lot of hungry lions at bay, although Rich Bickle in the terminal trucking entry has given him enough to think about right at this point, although he appears content to sit back in the second spot at least for the next half lap. Well, McCart is not a superstitious type. He's running number 22, which is always a competitive number. The number he wanted coming in was number 13, but it wasn't available. And surprising how many drivers actually are willing to take that number. Drivers are superstitious. Now here's Dick Anderson inside of Scott Hansen, who cannot get down to the bottom side of the speedway. Anderson is running a backup motor. He wasn't particularly happy with the horsepower in it this afternoon, but this is not necessarily a horsepower racetrack. The 15 Jimmy is Cope. Jimmy Cope, who has also passed Hansen, who is in a backup car, had problems in his primary car yesterday. You're talking about Dick Anderson and that bright red Dodge Adventure that he's running this season. He said, I got a mule of a motor in the car tonight. The thing is, this car is just a practice motor. It's not really that competitive. Remains single file. Well back to the 12th position. Jerry McCart getting some excellent laps up front. Some important experience. This is an excellent field of late model drivers. Many of the best are here. A big wreck in turn Fresh. one. Daryl Shelnut, the winner of this race last year, is one of the drivers involved. The six is Derek Kelly, the 72 that pulled away Mike Franklin, and Randy Renfro is in the fence. The Kimberly, North Carolina driver, the three-time champion at Southern National Speedway, climbing out of his car. He's got a small fire beneath the hood. Going to try to get the hood off. Looks like it might be the brake rotor, maybe some uh, brake fluid, but he wants to save that race car if he possibly can, and quickly the safety crew on the scene. Randy Renfro having to do a little hustle all, all by himself out there. You notice uh, that Randy's uh, strong, but not that strong. These are uh, fiberglass hoods. A lot of very lightweight body parts on these uh, machines and not too terribly expensive to replace, but that's not his concern right at this moment. He's run just about 10 laps of the event and, and now is watching it from outside the car, the worst place for a driver. And while we're under our first caution of the evening in the Hooter A200, we'll take this break and be right back. The cleanup continues on our first incident of the evening, a four-car wreck up in turn number one. Jerry McCart has led every lap from the pole position. Rich Bickle has moved from fifth to second. Mario Goslin is third. Billy Bigley Jr. fourth. And Matt Kenseth fifth. Now, the third member of our announce team is Doug Rice. He's, he's in the pits, but he's also in the backside grandstand area where a lot of the crew chiefs and spotters are. And let's check in with Doug for reports. Kansas in the pits right now, and he's getting attention to his damaged race car. Daniel King pulled in just a moment ago. He had a lot of front-end cosmetic damage mostly. They took the hood off of that machine and sent him back on his way. And one other little drama played out right before they dropped the green flag. Tracy Goodson finished fifth in the consolation race. So he was on the bubble to get in and thought he was going to get into the race today because Randy Renfro had had problems in the consolation race. Twice they told Tracy, start up your motor, you're going in. Then they held him up, and eventually he wound up not making the show. Randy Renfro got that spot, but right now Randy Renfro is headed to the garage area. All right, thank you, Doug. Uh, one thing we should mention here, we had a lot of rain here last night. They were supposed to qualify the cars. It was washed out, so uh, about a day and a half's worth of track activities were compressed into about five hours this afternoon, and the last chance qualifier finished just about 10 minutes before we came on the air, so there was high drama right up to the moment of the cars rolling onto the speedway. It's unfortunate that Tracy wasn't able to start the race because he's a, been such a regular competitor in the series. This is about the first event that he has missed for the Florida driver. Now, if you're just joining our telecast, Jerry McCart, our pole sitter, is the leader, and he brings the field back to green for back up to speed once again on lap number 24. 
looks up in his rearview mirror and he sees Richie Bickle there now. Bickle built the chassis on the lead car and the car that's beneath himself. Mario Goslin doing something of a conservative show here in the early going. It was how he won races last year. He basically sat back and watched until the race wound down towards the latter stages of the race. Then he took advantage of any problems anybody had. But tonight he's running in third place. He really thought he was going to sit on the pole here this evening, but McCart turned in a blistering lap here at DeSoto. Rex Bickle looking to improve on misfortune at the season opener at USA International Speedway when he was swept into a six-car incident that sidelined him before halfway. He'll run the series as often as he can this year. He's got a super truck deal for, or I should say now, a NASCAR Craftsman truck deal for 1996 in the Richard Petty machine. They've been done for a week speedway testing that uh, vehicle on several occasions, and it's getting faster and faster. The car Bickle's driving here, like you said, was crashed over at Lakeland at the USA Speedway. It took them several days to put a new clip on the front end of that car and replace a lot of body work. There's Ron Barfield. There's another driver that's headed for the Craftsman Truck Series, running right in front of Rick Crawford. This Barfield, the protege now of Bill Elliott. This is a battle for 11th on the Speedway. And look at a little bit of nudge in there. No doubt about that is Rick Crawford, who won the season opening All-Pro race, gains the 11th position. Crawford had a good, strong run in the season opening Hooters race down at USA International Speedway as McCart continues to set the pace up front. If you're just joining us, there'll be 200 laps around this 3 8 mile speedway. The Soto Speedway was repaved at the beginning of last year. There's a six degree banking in the straightaways degree banking in the turns. It's considered a very fast racetrack, but one that has multiple grooves as the event wears on, and we expect to see that second groove start to come in in about 25 laps or so as they lay some more rubber down. I really think Richie, Richie Bickle wants to lead this race. He can't quite get down to the bottom of the racetrack as soon as he'd like. A little further back, though, let's take a look at Jimmy Cope. Cope having a strong run with Matt Kenson, and there's Scott Hansen from the ASA hounding him hard. And there's contact, and there's a little bit of fiberglass damage to the right front of Jimmy Cope. His nickname is Mr. Excitement, and he's giving Kenson all the excitement he can handle for right now. You see the damage. It doesn't appear to be a tire rub at this point. We'll keep an eye on it to see. Looks like Bickle wants to be able to get the top spot, Bill, but just can't quite seem to find a way. But he looks downstairs and has to go back in line. It looks like he's getting a better bite coming up off the corner, but can't quite get the horsepower to move on by. And he's uh, using up a lot of brake on the 45 car. Bickle is trying to get into the corner and dive beneath him. His brake rotor is starting to heat up now, and you can actually see it glowing. And as they come off of turn two going down the back stretch, real interesting note going into turn three. Now you're going to see a change in color. That's a change in asphalt. There's a dip right there. And it's very important how the drivers get into turn three to make sure their car settles down right away. Otherwise, they'll break loose and head up right toward the wall. Here's an example of what we mean. And we got caution on the track. See the Our little second yellow. yellow of the evening comes out on lap number 37. John Crow's got problems. The number 38, the driver who year. also had trouble last season, or last uh, race in the season opener up against the fence, but doesn't look to be too serious, Bill. It looks like he just kind of drove up there and stopped, but he is fairly close to the outside retaining wall. Hopefully he didn't do any damage to the car for the driver that picked up the Rookie of the Year honors. And uh, that was going to point that out a little earlier. Uh, what we're kind of viewing it on our own TV screen is the fact that the yellow light that you saw on the dash of the leader came on immediately time the yellow flag was thrown. Mark, maybe you'd like to address that a little bit. That's something brand new for the Hooters Cup Series this year. Yeah, it's called race safe, and it's thrown uh, from a switch in the flag stand, and somebody is monitoring the starter, and the second the yellow comes on the speedway for any incident, they also throw that yellow light, which immediately tells the field to slow down. It's an important safety device that a number of other racing series are, series are using, and it's a good idea. And we'll be back with more in a moment. And a quick caution. The green flag is back out here at DeSoto Speedway after John Crow stopped up against the fence in turn one, was able to pull away. We'll follow up on that story in just a moment as Jerry McCart continues to lead. 
The second place car in line, but not second place in the running order, is Daniel Keene, involved in the first incident of the evening. He's missing a hood. He's trying to get back in the lead lap, but McCart is putting some distance between himself and second place Rich Bickle, sitting in the third spot on the high side of the track, the red number 10, the Budweiser sponsored Mario Goslin. Beneath him is the seven of Daryl Shelnut, a lap car also involved in the Daniel Keene incident, along with about five other cars on lap number 18. The 42 car, brand new color and a brand new number. The name is Mike Garvey. Now, longtime late model viewers say, hey, he should be in 91, but the sponsorship is Coors Light, and Coors Light is number 42 in Winston Cup. And they said, hey, why don't you change your color? And since they're paying him to, he said, of course. Well, it's good that they're maintaining some type of consistency because it will probably mean at some time when they use the Winston Cup car in a poster promotion, this car will probably also be pictured in that same display. Let's go to the pits and Doug Rice. Mark, Mark, you can't actually go to the pits here at DeSoto Speedway because there are none. The pit road is behind the backstretch grandstand, so the crew chiefs during the race watch the action from the grandstands. I'm actually on row two of the backstretch with Greg Campbell. Greg is the crew chief for the leader and the pole sitter, Jerry McCartan. He's been keeping a good eye on his guy. And your guy's been running well. You haven't given up the lead yet. Well, it's kind of hard to hear what you said, but the Brown Fiber Trailer Crafters car is running real good right now. We're just getting in a rhythm where we can make it to the first break. We're just running our race and letting everybody do what they got to do. And for 50 laps, we've been running a darn good race because he's been the pole sitter and the leader all along. And the crew chiefs are watching it from the cheap seats. All right, Doug, from now on, I'll call it the pit back stretch. How about that? <laughs> Jared McCart a little loose that last time around. We'll keep an eye on that to see if that's an indication of some tire wear. And Bill, let's next time by we'll watch the brake rotors. You can see them glowing red. Well, they're there, see the right front. And look at this. Oh, he's there. He's Inside, there. Rich Bickle will take the lead as Dick Anderson is off the pace on the backstretch. He had been in fifth place. And we have a new leader, Rich Bickle, on lap number 53. So Bickle was able to get beneath the leader in the number one position. Dick Anderson is in major trouble as far as points is concerned because he will have to pit in the infield on the figure eight track. He will not be able to get outside the racetrack to get service and get back in quickly. First race of the season, Dick Anderson had been as high as second place, then tire problems, then a blown engine put him out early. Now Anderson is having problems again, and Bill, just like we mentioned last year, a very slow start, but this man came on to win four races. Here's another look at how Rich Bickle affected the first lead change of the night. McCart just looked like he was loose getting into the turn, never really got the line he wanted, and sure enough, Bickle saw the opening and jumped on it like a hungry dog. Well, Bickle was down at the bottom of the racetrack, but he had it angled into the corner. What happens here at this racetrack is a driver will go up and sweep out against that outside retaining wall, just like Bickle's doing now. Then he starts to turn his car in gradually, doesn't want to get down to the bottom of the racetrack beneath that yellow line. If he does so, the car will start to push as it bottoms out on its suspension. And look at how far the top three cars have opened up a margin a full straightaway advantage over the fourth place cars and some lapped traffic. The outside, look at this, 32. That's Dirk Stevens. On the high side is Scott Hansen in the 53. Then it's Billy Bigley Jr., Matt Kenseth, and Mike Garvey. And Garvey is moving up nicely through the field, a subpar qualifying effort 19. He's up to unofficially the eighth spot. Now, Daryl Sheldon is a lapped car. He is the defending race champion here at DeSoto Speedway. He's also a man who has a very fine record of performance at this particular track. In about 10 appearances here, he's won eight of them. He's the driver from South Florida, normally raced out at Hialeah Speedway. Came and joined this tour last year, won this race here. He said, I was only going to run a couple of them. Whoa, Daniel Keene goes round. And he got a little bit of help from Matt Kenseth, and you can see that coming. Caution number three comes out on lap 60 for contact between the 68 of Matt Kenseth and Daniel Keene, who's already had some problems tonight. Keene uh, running on the inside lane of traffic, a lap down at least after having problems in the early going. Minus his hood now and likes to drive down to the center of the figure eight track. All the replay. Here's part of the problem was that Matt Kenseth was trying to get into a hole that wasn't there. He's was trying to get down in front of Daryl Shelnut. 
and just miscalculated. Yeah, right into the rear bumper cover of the five car of Daniel Keene. Daniel probably not too happy about that, but at the same time, the leaders were coming up on him and they were looking for clear racetrack. And we also need to say, in fairness to Matt Kenseth, that we're not assessing blame here. There are a number of factors as the Ronnie Sanders car is sitting in the crossover area in the infield, and that is obviously a bad sign. Here's another look at it. Ken Seth trying to get inside. Now, Bill, the one thing that we have to say in fairness is that it could be that Daniel Keene was checking up just a little bit, and at that point, Ken Seth really couldn't do anything about it. He was hard on the brakes. You could see the right front brake rotor glowing, just glowing, and the car also pushed up the racetrack just a hair as he was trying to hang on to it. Ken Seth, of course, trying to turn to the left, can't afford to turn back to the right. Just a racing accident that took place here in the early going. And heads up by the rest of the field to keep that a single car incident. Now here it is from the high camera down the front stretch. Now Ken Seth has all but cleared Daryl Shelnut and his spotter will be telling him there that he has. Now he's trying to tuck himself into that hole and that's where the contact comes in, Bill. And frankly, it's kind of hard to tell if Keen wasn't already just a little bit loose before the contact. Well, Kenson tried to get by when he was hard on the throttle and then just ran into the back. And yeah, things happen, especially in racing on a short track. It is really hard because you're running right on the racket edge every lap. 2,900-pound car, you're taking it into the corner as fast as you possibly can. And for a lot of drivers, you're just hanging on to the steering wheel. Will Bill Green next time by. Daryl Shelnut on the inside is a lapped car, and he is trying to unlap himself. Obviously, if he could do it, we would definitely not want to count him out of this race. It is, after all, 200 laps, and Shelnut's trying real hard to get back on the tail end of it, but will he get it? No, he won't. Rich Bickle gets a terrific bite up high. Shelnut's not about to give it up, though. And Jerry McCart's wondering, do I really want to get in the middle of this right at this moment? But Bickle clears it. Shelnut really at a disadvantage trying to take the lead. Bickle in the better groove on the high side of the racetrack. He's able to carry more speed and carry more momentum. And, and uh, Shelnut wasn't able to do that. And there was contact that did not amount to anything between the 10 and 15 just to going into turn three a moment ago. Jimmy Cope and Mario Gosling got together. That's just short track racing, folks. And now that Rich Bickle has got the lap car of Daryl Shelnut between him and third place, let's see what kind of advantage he can open up here. Even with the cautions, this race is running very, very quickly. We're already up to lap 70 on the next circuit by. This race is really a rapid pace. Our leader turning the track in 14.7 seconds, just a hair off the qualifying speed of Jerry McCart. And basically, that's four laps a minute speed of over 100 miles an hour, just a hair over 100. And right now, the man playing the Greyhound, everybody playing the Rabbit, I should say, to everybody else's Greyhound is Rich Bickle, Concord, North Carolina, member of a two-car team. The other member of that group is Freddie Quarry, who finished second in the season opener. But here's a terrific battle for third, as Jimmy Cope is now up into the parade. They've, he's had some contact with Mario Gossett. You see some tire mark on the door number of that number 10 machine. Cope carrying Miller sponsorship, Goslin Budweiser sponsorship. So here's a little bit of beer wars. Goslin, the defending champion of the series, the inaugural champion, picked up that honor last year. Would like to be able to repeat. He's always been a very conservative runner, a man of very few words. Let's his driving speak for it. We'll take a look at the beating and banging that's going on out here. Goslin has to check up just a little bit because of Jerry McCart. There's just ever so slight a contact. Look at that tremendous driving there. And then says, okay, and then look at that. That's lifting the rear end. That's what we saw a little bit earlier at speed. Doesn't look like much there, but I'll tell you what, when you're in the 10 car sitting up there and all of a sudden your rear wheels come off the ground, it's a whole new experience. It's all forward bite at that point. And you'd better hope the front wheels hook up but not hook you into the wall. When he turned that car back to the right, it could have easily just headed to the outside retaining wall. Fortunately, he was able to fight it with all elbows as he had his arms crossed up. We're, we're 23 laps from halfway and a mandatory seven minute break as drivers will go out the back track entrance to their pits for service and tires. 
And the man right now setting the way is Rich Bickle. Now here's Jody Ridley, who had a subpar qualifying effort, had to advance through the qualifying race to make the show. But qualifying is not something that uh, the all-pro veteran is particularly good at. Well, Jody would probably like to run 400 laps here rather than 200. He seems to get better as the race goes on. But one driver who is backed up from his third starting position is the 28 of Billy Bigley, running right behind Jody at the present time as he runs up on Rick Crawford. He's beginning to reel him in. Ridley showing a little bit of damage. You can see that fiberglass in the right front flapping in the breeze. He's had contact with somebody as well. Ridley carrying brand new colors. Usually he's been green, or rather he's been blue, a lot of white, sometimes red. Now he's almost all green. Skull on the car for the entire year among the best sponsorship deals he's ever had. Bickle has almost a full straightaway advantage over the second place runner at the present time as he is now dominating this race at this juncture. Bickle, a man who's won the Snowball Derby on numerous occasions. He's now worried about anything that's going on back here as close quarters action between Crawford and Ridley. Crawford, who did not win a race last year. Ridley, who did not win a race last year for the first time since the 1960s. Tony Ridley, one of the most popular drivers in sportsman-type racing, dives down to the bottom of the racetrack and tries to draw it right up, even though he's got lots of damage on the right front corner of this. And look at the brake rotor. It is glowing red as he stands on the binders getting into the corner. He'll try to set the car up and make the run off the corner. It'll be a drag race. He's not going to try to get into his quarter panel, but eh, he got very, very close, but just couldn't get down to the bottom of the racetrack. For 15 laps from halfway and a little nudge there. That's just not just a gentle kiss in short track racing. This right now is a Chevrolet Ford battle. Chevrolet being driven by Rick Crawford and a Ford being driven by Jody Ridley. And look at night racing. Isn't that incredible? At nighttime, you can see just how hard. Watch it. That's on the brakes. Look at the rotors. There's That's off the brakes. Can't quite high. see it, but you can see how they glow when he stops on that left pedal. All the bias on the brakes is on the front of these cars rather than on the rear. They get the cars to set up in the corners and stand on the brakes and plant that front end as they make the turn in. Beckel right now is running on a little tether around this racetrack. It has almost a perfect line around the Soto Speedway. And he's got a two-second advantage over second place, Jerry McCart. And now that's oh. dirt tracking. These are bias ply tires, folks. These aren't radios. You can kick that rear end out a little bit and drive it the old dirt track style. And that's what Rick Crawford is doing. He's really putting some heat in those tires now. Crawford's rear end starting to slide around. That's what Ridley wants him to do. Make one little slip, and he'll be beneath him and pick up the position here before the halfway break. And a spin right in front of him. And it's Jerry McCart up in the wall in turn number two. The man who led the first 20, 45 laps of this race is now up against the fence. And he wants some assistance. He wants somebody to get over there very quickly before he goes several laps down. He cut the ignition off, and when he did, the yellow light went off on the dashboard. Here we see from a view in turn one what took place. It looks like McCart was trying to miss the car of Scott Hansen. Maybe they got together coming off the second corner there. But McCart backs up against the outside retaining wall for the driver that started on the pole. Some damage on the right-hand side of the car. He's got a wheel mark right by the 22. Looks like somebody kind of caved that in for him. His helmet is off. Looks like he's ready for the tow back to the pit area. And as disappointing as it is for him to be in this position, he still has to be pleased with his performance both in qualifying and the early portions of tonight's race where he, he led almost uh, to the one-quarter mark of the event. Unfortunately for McCart, his night is perhaps ended. Now, he may be able to go in get some repairs to the car, and then come back out and run the second half, or at least bragging rights, because since the race is split in two, a man could be a lap down and basically lead, but not win the race in the second half, just to say, hey, look, I had a car that could have done it tonight. And Jody Ridley, who is putting a lot of pressure on Rick Crawford, with just seven laps to go until halfway, if we know Jody like we do, we think he will be content to just sit there, make the necessary adjustments, and then go back out and race hard in the second half. 
taking a look at that good looking battle and these guys were really racing between Jody Ridley the seasoned veteran and the former all pro champion on numerous occasions look how close he came to almost getting by he was there and everything went down right in front of him and he smartly backed out with throttle but very heads up driver That's now, hand signals about. hand signals are very important in motorsports the reason we mention this is because there were some uh, hand signals being exchanged uh, between Mr. Crawford and Mr. Ridley more on the Mr. Crawford side. Uh, he did get a couple of nudges back there, and uh, while they continue to attend to Jerry McCart, we will take this opportunity to take a break and return to Bradenton, Florida. Don't go away. Promotional consideration and a fee has been paid by Simpson Safety Products, the world leader in motorsports safety equipment and apparel. We are four laps from halfway and a break here at DeSoto Speedway in Bradenton, Florida. A most entertaining show so far with Jerry McCart, the early leader, but he was the reason for our most recent caution. And unfortunately, he will have no chance to win the race because he could not get his car started, went a lap down, and could not get to the pits. But a very impressive performance by that young man who sat on the pole here, and also an equally impressive performance by Rich Bickle, who has since taken over from our pole sitter. Unfortunately for McCart, he's on the hook, going back into the pit area outside the racetrack along the back straightaway. One thing I'd like to say about this guy, he went straight from go-karts to late model sportsman cars in the Big Ten Series up at Concord Motor Speedway. And Doug has some follow-up for us in the pits. Well, the leader is in the pits now, Rich Bickle. Rich, the car really started to come to you about a quarter way through the race. Well, the car was pretty good right off the bat. Uh, you know, I mean, the 22 car there had a little bit of run going there, but it's uh, you know, the car is just is running real well. It's, you know, I thank Jesus and I as our from Terminal Truck and Motorsports. Uh, I thank Todd at the shop. He worked his butt off to get this thing ready. They got it done late Thursday night, so they did a heck of a job getting ready for me. So Rich Bickle, last minute work on the car, and they got it ready, and he's the leader when we get to halfway, and we'll get out of the way and let him finish affecting the four-tire change on Rich Bickle here. And, Bill, that's an interesting decision that we'll want to follow up on. We're only four laps away from halfway and a two-point bonus for being the halfway leader and a financial bonus. Uh, in fact, you notice a number of the drivers are in the pits. Uh, we wonder if there hasn't been a call by the race officials to go ahead and uh, throw the seven-minute caution at this point. We'll follow up on that story. That's the naturally fresh car, I believe, of number four, Randy Fox. Hondo is his nickname. Uh, he had to get into the field by way of the last chance qualifying race, but it doesn't matter how you make it as long as you do. 53 cars attempted to make a 28-car starting field, not unlike what happened in the season opening race at U.S. International Speedway when 85 drivers showed up and 45 of them went home disappointed. There are a number of cars, Bill, that we've seen to this point as the track is now vacant as all the teams have gone to the backstretch pits. A number of cars that look very equal in that first portion of the race. Some of them look like they were biding their time. Some of them look like they were a little bit impatient. A number of the drivers were running quite conservative, just trying to get to the halfway mark. We see some damage there okay, on Chad, the eight car, and that is the Freddie Freddy Freddy Query car out of Concord, North Carolina. And he has been to war, at least a skirmish. And Doug is down right in the middle of the battlefield. That's right. Hit road back on behind the main uh, grandstands. Here's a pretty busy place. Freddie Query, your teammates in good shape. How about your car? It's just a little bit tight. We kind of really being careful there. The first car of the race, but uh, now it's time to go. We got to change the spring here and see if we can get faster and get to the front. Got a little battle scar on the back. What happens? I don't know. It's, it's kind of rough back there while it's running, you know, but um, everybody's just racing hard and trying to get to the front and win this race. Freddie Query, teammate of the race leader Rich Bickle during the halfway break here. He's affected his repairs. They pulled the sheet metal out on the left rear here, and Freddie's ready to go back in it. He was the leader in points coming into the race tonight here in DeSoto. Freddie's a very soft-spoken guy. Formerly was a shop instructor in Concord High School. We're going to take this break. We'll be back with more exciting action here from the Hooter Aid 200. Tonight's telecast by Hooters, a delightfully tacky restaurant by Jackaroo. If you ain't got Jackaroo, you ain't got Jack. And by Goodyear, number one in racing, number one in tires. 
It is a large crowd here tonight, Bill, which I think is a testimony to the popularity, the increasing popularity of this Hooters Cup series in its second season. The weather here last night and early this morning was terrible, yet the fans have come out. Everybody's been talking about this series. There's buzz all across the nation about the number of competitors competing in the series, about the massive amount of money that's being paid out. The fever throughout the eastern United States is such that everybody wants to run this particular touring division because of all the money and the exposure. Let's go down to Doug Rice in the backstretch pits. Bill Hennessy is the resident gearhead on this crew, and he can probably explain exactly what they're doing here. But they were very busy in the Billy Bigley pits. They changed the rear end gear ratio. These are the ones that were in the car for the first half of the race. He said, I don't like the way the car's pulling up off the corner. So they changed the rear end gear ratio for the second half. So if they guessed right, Billy Bigley Jr. could make a run to the front. Sounds like he went to a lower gear ratio, so he would get a little more torque off the corners. It's very easy to change in a quick change rear end, especially like a Franklin. You remove about eight bolts, then hold a rear cover on, you change those two gears out very, very quickly, and of course replenish it with oil and you're ready to go racing again. It was interesting that the man that sat on the pole went to a lower gear ratio because the motor that he bought was intended for Lanier Raceway, and the cam was wrong for this racetrack, and he said it surprised him that he sat on the pole. So, you know, Jerry McCart had to dial his car in to win the pole. Now we've got another competitor dialing their car in so they can run competitive during the second 100 laps of competition. Well, Jerry McCart came to greet just before halfway, but he'll still have some solace in winning a $1,000 pole bonus from Discount Auto Parts. In fact, at the end of the season, the driver who has won the most poles will win $10,000 from Discount Auto Parts. They keep throwing money and money and more money interest in the series, especially among all these competitors, because it seems to me there's a surprise in each and every race we've been to throughout the last season and this year. Well, last season we had 14 different pole sitters in the 20 events run. This season, two races, two different poles. Now, let's reset the field up front for you. Still on the point is Rich Bickle, but during that mid-race break, they had to fix an oil leak. We will keep an eye on that. Sitting in second is Jimmy Cope. Third, it's Dirk Stevens. Fourth is Mario Goslin. And fifth is Jody Ridley, although on the track, it shows to be Mike Garvey. The green's back out, and now we'll get down to the chase for the $15,000 for real as Bickle gets a good jump on the restart, and Cope clears lap traffic quickly. Darrell Sheldon was that lap traffic dropping down to the inside of the racetrack. Working off the second corner, Bickle has the advantage, but Jimmy Cope sure is having a good run this evening. Jimmy Cope, who had a good run at this race last year as well, came into 1996 with a new attitude, the Miller sponsorship not only increased his interest because last year he was running largely out of his own pocket, it also forced him to, to make some decisions. And he said, I want to be the best driver I've ever been this year, not just for the sponsor, Yo. but for myself. As caution is out for a big mangler in turn four, one of them is Hal Goodson, the reigning all-pro champ. Rick Crawford Fred was Fred Corey was there. Rick Crawford was there. And a can opener is torn off the front end. It's a multi-part wreck. That's Russell Bearden and Dwayne Dempsey, both advanced to the feature from the qualifying race. And Goodson will have to wait for the field to pass by in turn three before he can get to the back pits and start to do a lot of repair work. The second race in a row, he's been involved in an incident. And a little extra body weight there for Scott Walters. And uh, I wonder if he knows it's back there, Bill. I don't. I believe he does, because I think his spotter was probably telling, hey, shake the car a little bit, and you can lose that front uh, fiberglass, which apparently came off of a white car. We'll have to identify it. Russell Beard now climbing out of his machine. I've seen fuel cans. I've seen bumpers. I have never seen a hood dragged <laughs> around the racetrack before. Uh, he still got it there, along with one of the right front fenders. One of the safety workers is going to come out and help remove that. And it won't be hard for us to identify the missing car. There it is. Yep, Scott, Scott Hansen. Hansen, who's had a long evening. A lot of beating and banging on that car. He's give as, given as well as received. And 
now he's given up part of his body. Well, one of his sponsors is AFCO, and AFCO makes shocks, and suspension pieces, and coil springs. They don't make body parts. He needed a body sponsor tonight. Stomp it a little bit. It's hung on it. Well, what's really got it hung is the hood pins. One of the hood pins is still got it hung up under the back of the Scott Walters car. Walters worried about scoring now. He doesn't want to lose a lap because we score every lap of competition. You know, i got to wonder what his spotter's telling him. You got somebody on your rear deck lid? No, you got somebody's hood there. Scott Hansen, uh, who was involved in a big crash in the season opener, blamed Mike Eddy for a five-car incident uh, that was before lap 100 there that sidelined him. Came back to... Uh, the Hooters series for the second straight event uh, likes the way he's treated here. He says uh, people here are real nice. They appreciate the drivers coming, let everybody know about it. And he says that's really important to us competitors because sometimes that's not always the case. And his cold air box, which means the radiator is crushed out, which may predicate a heating problem on this late model sportsman entry. Picking up the Russell Beard car. The safety workers now directing traffic on a route. We are scoring 102 laps now. 102 laps. And of course, we have to have a green flag lap for halfway in order to pay the big money. Russell Bearden, who was named the rising star of the Hooters Cup Series in 1995, uh, ends up rising on the hook, will go to the back pits. And this is what happens when cars are tight like this. A little damage on Rick Crawford's car will follow him around the speedway. It appears to be all on the right side, a little rear bumper damage. That's a rubber bumper. Costs about $100 to replace. Uh, the fiberglass quarter panels in the car, about $150. And Bill, I think uh, we estimated that the grand sold to replace uh, all the body panels and pieces is about what? Uh, $750, $800? Anywhere between $750 and $900. It's important how much you're willing to fabricate yourself, like the rear trunk deck. Russell Bearden's car with massive damage on it. Most of these drivers will take their cars back home and then uh, repair them. And it's very, very easy. You do it with pop rivets. You just pop rivet the body on. Now let's go to Doug in the pits. Jerry McCarr was our surprise pole sitter tonight, but Jerry, you showed with that quick lap and qualifying was no fluke. You led the first quarter of this race. Yeah, the car was real good. Uh, Rich seemed to be a little bit quicker than we were, so we were going to check up and let Rich lead. Because Rich and I were you know, pretty much leaving the field and we were just going to follow him, let him go. And then Hanson came on strong, and Scott and I got together down in the corner, and the wreck probably looked a lot worse than it was. It, we got together and broke a stern knuckle, and then it turned back into him. So it was really just a, an amplified racing accident, more or less. So for Jerry McCart, his first Hooters Cup race, a bittersweet affair. He got the pole. He led for about 45 laps, but he's out for even tour. And we're back under green once again with Bickle continuing to lead the field. Let's see if Jimmy Cope can close and overtake the leader. It's hard to get around this racetrack. Everybody's on fresher tires, so it's going to take a few laps for them to come up to temperature. And then let's see Whoa, if that shovel as the car goes hard into turn one. Daryl Shelnut, something broke on that race car. You can see the sparks in the corner of your screen. And that is clearly a race-ending crash on lap 105. Our sixth caution of the evening for the defending race champion who was already having a long evening. A lap down, now done for the night. Well, he's ready to climb out of his navy blue Chevy Monte Carlo. On the replay, we see him down on the inside of the racetrack. Wayne Dempsey right behind him and the car on the outside, Mario Gosselin. Now, they scraped together right here just at the start-finish line, and it kind of skews the car around. And then he comes across in front of Mario Gosselin. And Gosselin is standing on the binders. And it wasn't something that broke in the car. That's where we saw it. It was clearly contact with the defending Hooters Cup Series champion. Well, they basically hung tires there a little bit. The right rear on this car, the Darrell Sheldon car, made contact with the left front on Gosselin's car, and it kind of just slammed him around real quick like. It's hard to hang on to one of these cars once it starts to break. And these two drivers got together last year in the race in Orlando, so it's not the kind of thing that they want to have happen under any conditions, but now with a the driver, they've had it happen to before. We'll be back as the cleanup continues. Shellnut's not happy. We'll be back. And we are back at DeSoto Speedway in Bradenton, Florida, where the cleanup continues on Darrell Shelnut's incident with Mario Goslin. 
And Doug Rice is in the backstretch pits with more on one of the victims of one of our recent incidents. How Goodson is in right now, and they are just about through effecting repairs on the number 16 Hooters car. The front end totally demolished, and they have got about a ton of 200 mile per hour duct tape. We'll get a quick word. Hal, tell us a little bit about what happened to you out there. Well, I, I, when I got here, the track was blocked, and somebody had me checked up in the back, and I couldn't stop, and I believe I hit Crawford. I couldn't see real good for the smoke, but I'm. You know, Hooter 8 and Hooters, they're, they're behind this series, they're behind me, and, um, you know, this first two races, we had some bad shows, but, um, you know, we're going to win one of these things for a long time. It's been a long night for the 1995 Slim Jim All-Pro champion trying to cut his way through the Hooters Cup Series in 1996. It's very seldom that Hal Goodson crashes, and it's very seldom that this driver here has found himself going around backwards. A lot of frustration being shown by Darrell Sheldon, the driver out of Davie, Florida, who of course raced at Hialeah, Florida over the years. He came here last year and won this race before go away tonight. Disappointed. And Darrell Shelnut uh, freely admits that when he first came to the Hooters Cup Series in 1995, he had no intention of running all the races. In fact, he didn't even register for Rookie of the Year. But then he got into it, won this race, started to make a little bit of money, was paying his racing bills, stayed with the series the entire season, and finished in a tie for third in the points with John Crow, also a rookie. So if he had registered for the rookie honors, we might have had co-rookies of the year. This driver, of course, uh, coming out of a family of racers. His father and uncle both ran the number seven, just like Darrell is running here this evening. His dad helps him on the car. Of course, they're going to have a long tow back down to Davie, Florida to work on it this week. Now, if you're just joining our telecast, we're under our sixth caution of the evening here on lap number 113 for an incident involving Darrell Shelnut. In turn number one, he came in contact with the defending series champion Mario Goslin. Jerry McCart was the pole sitter for tonight's race, picking up a $1,000 bonus and led the first quarter of the event before Rich Bickle got by and has led ever since. And it's been fairly uh, uneventful for Mr. Bickle up front in that terminal trucking Chevrolet, but we don't anticipate it's going to stay that way for very long. Points are important toward the season payout in the 20-race Hooters Cup schedule. The winner will get at least 185 points. The, in fact, the points payout is very similar to Winston Cup as we look at the remnants of Scott Hansen's car. He's giving up a little bit, a little bit of fiberglass here, a, a bumper there, and before you know it, the only thing left may be the roll cage and the engine by the time we're done. But to continue our point about the points uh, payout in the series, they uh, changed the system this year, very similar to Winston Cup. They paid bonus points for qualifying, the driver who leads a lap gets five. The driver who leads the most laps, and right at this point, it looks like that might be Mr. Bickle, gets an additional five points. The halfway leader gets two points. And the driver who improves most from his starting position picks up five points. So there's the opportunity here for a payout of well over 200 points. A long look at Scott Hansen's car. If you'll take a look, you see those hoses that look like they're going back. Well, those are not hoses carrying any type of fluid. Otherwise, they would have been scraped through. Those are air duct hoses which feed air to the brake rotors. The blue box you see is the box that's the cold air box to direct the air into the radiator. Hanson's uh, missing a lot of body work, but the car looks like it's okay. Hanson crashed uh, big time down at Lakeland, Florida in the opening race of the season and had that car as a backup in uh, his uh, truck, his transporting. And he was looking for a good run here tonight, and I think he would have probably had one, but aerodynamically, his car is a pig right now. <laughs> but a fast pig. Maybe not the fastest pig, but that, that Parker can really haul it around the track. Okay, enough with the pig jokes. Let's get back to, uh, as we look at some of the drivers in the field here, we know that Rich Bickle continues as our race leader. Sitting in the second spot is Jimmy Coke. Oh, let's give a good call to uh, Dirk, Dirk Stevens sitting in the third spot. There's Hal Goodson. The, uh, as Doug said, the repair, repairs have been effected. He's back on the track and uh, won't get much of anything tonight except maybe another couple of positions in the points. And after all, that is important. This is a long season. Hal Goodson's crew chief says, my wife refuses to let me move to Darlington, South Carolina. And Hal was riding around out here minus some body work. The reason I mention this is Steve Walker, the crew chief on the car, lives down south of Manning, South Carolina, and has to commute about two hours a day just to get up and work at Hal Goodson's shop. 
defending All-Pro champion, and he's happy to have him. Uh, he speaks very highly of him, and that's excellent the, the mechanic. Not only dedication, but uh, talent as well, and, that, and that's not something you often find. In fact, I was talking to a couple of drivers today in the, uh, in the pits, and they're saying, you know, we're trying to find good crew people, but there are so many great chassis people, so many great body men, so many great mechanics in late model racing all over the country that sometimes it's really hard to find qualified people as we get ready to go back to racing in less than a lap. The most difficult part for any crew members to be able to get off and go to the races. Most of them have a full-time job and basically show up at 6 o'clock in the evening and work till 1 and 2 o'clock in the morning. Richie Bickle, the RBR racing entry of Gene Eisenhower, the terminal trucking sponsor of the car, jumps out now as the green flag flies once again here in Brayton, Florida at the Solo Speedway. And he has put Billy Bigley Jr. back a lap down. Bigley, the one who changed gears during the mid-race break. Jimmy Cope is the black 15. Field charging into turn three once again. Cope way up the high side trying to find his way around Bigley. Not always the best way on cooler tires as Bickle opens up a six-car length advantage. Bickle, a competitor who came out of Wisconsin, relocated down to Concord, North Carolina, and moved his chassis business down there, has found himself really a driver that can win in almost any type of situation. Richard Petty has chosen him to drive his Craftsman truck this year. And let's give a call to the 32 of Dirk Stevens, the Dumbwater Washington driver who moved to the southeast a few years back to run Bush Grand National. Plans haven't gone quite as expected. He's come to run Hooters Cup racing, races whenever possible. And the truth is that 32 car that's sitting back in the third spot chasing our leader, Rich Bickle, that Dirk Stevens car is actually an all-pro car. It's got steel interiors. The car's a little bit heavier. It's running 18-degree ports on the engine, which means he has to run 50 extra pounds. And weight is a big enemy in short track racing. So Dirk Stevens driving a great race. The 42 car just on the left of your screen is Mike Garvey, started 19th, up to 5th. The 98 is Jody Ridley in 6th. Contact there. That's Green Tipsy. Tipsy goes around after making contact out of the fourth quarter. Another car trying to avoid that spins also. And the car that came in contact is Scott Hansen, who is tonight's Mr. Excitement as we stay green. Bickle leaps him down the back straightaway. And here's a man who is stuck in the mud. Wayne Dempsey in the CD Roma's number nine is having difficulty moving, and I imagine that the safety crews would like to get over there and help him, but they don't want to do it under a green flag situation. And because he is out of harm's way, we will stay under green, but there's a classic example of how slick a racing slick really is. Absolutely no bite whatsoever on the wet grass of the infield here at DeSoto Speedway. Riding in second place, Dirk Stevens riding in third, trying to bear down on the man that is leading. And there is Matt Kempson. You can't count him out right now, running behind Randy Fox and Mario Goslin there in the 10 car. And Rod Barfield, we finally get to talk about him a little bit this evening. He's right there with that same pack. Now that's Matt Kenseth and Mario Goslin are racing for position. And so is Randy Fox. This is a good run for Hondo man who went down to the opening race of the season was involved in the crash in his last chance qualifier. His car looked more like the Jackaroo barbecue sauce entry than the naturally fresh because his Whoa. teammate Mike McCrary Jr. lent him body panels. McCrary unfortunately did not make tonight's show. Tonight the naturally fresh colors are in their original scheme in their correct place on Randy Fox's car as he and Mario Goblin have worked clear of that tight race traffic. Matt Kenson down on the bottom of the racetrack. Hondo is really protecting his ground. He's staying right down there and trying to squeeze off Kenson. Kenson wants to make a run and get a defender up beneath that quarter panel. Looks like if he's going to do it, it's going to have to take place coming off the quarter and not getting into the quarter. But look at Barfield drive by to the outside of Matt Kenson. He kind of went to sleep there for a second. We haven't had much opportunity to talk about Ron Barfield. He qualified in the top 10 has been hovering around there pretty much ever since, but Barfield having a good, solid, if unspectacular run. 
72 cars, Mike Franklin, who was involved in one of our earlier incidents, uh, uneventful for him just to spin, was able to drive away quickly. But look at Barfield. He's around Kenseth, and he's got an angle on Fox in the tricky turn Whoa! three contact. And hang on, Hondo. And yes, he does. <laughs> Hondo hangs on, but Barfield kind of blows the horn, the crow one, and say, look, if you're going to be running with me, you better give me a little room because I'm going to be coming through. The engine in this car, powered by Ernie Elliott. Ernie Elliott built the engine in the Rod Barfield entry, the Michael Motorsports entry. And this driver is scheduled to drive the ARCA race next weekend down in Atlanta, Georgia, and then try to make it up to Jefferson Speedway to run that afternoon. Here we go into the corner here. He's standing on the binders. You can see the rotors light up. Hondo checks up for a second, and there's Barfield, and he smartly backed out on the accelerator to keep from turning him all the way around. And if he had gone around, I'm sure race officials would have considered that merely a racing accident. No intent involved there whatsoever. Hondo, by the way, for any of you crew chiefs out there looking for a job, as Barfield went way up the racetrack, and look at Crawford jump into the spot there. Franklin also moving by smartly. 07 of Scott Walters now that he doesn't have Hansen's hood attached to his rear is back on the charge. Rick Crawford, the winner at Volusia County Speedway in the All-Pro season opener, having a good strong run here once again tonight. Unofficially, he is posted in the 14th spot. Matt Kenson now to the inside of Randy Fox. He's able to go by. Earlier, he couldn't do that because Randy was covering down the bottom of the racetrack with that little bit of lost motion earlier, probably took the edge off of his tires. And Hondo is in a spot he doesn't want to be. His car isn't handling well. He's at the top of the racetrack that opens up downstairs for a lot of other drivers. Once again, Rich Pickle, ever since lap 53, has been setting the pace. He and Jimmy Cope have pulled away from Dirk Stevens, who sits in the third spot, as we're back on that Hondo Barfield battle. Hondo looking for a crew chief. He says, I got to find one soon. Hey, I've been racing three years. I need to learn all I can as fast as I can. Let's see what we can learn from Doug Rice in the pits. Where you want to be, you're in the pits, you're already in your street clothes. Tell us a little bit about what went on out there. Well, we were trying to make a lap up. Uh, we lost a lap with a flat tire earlier, and uh, Mario got a little bit excited, a little bit antsy, I guess, and got in the right rear corner and turned me in the fence. Your car done for the night, then? Yeah, we were running good. The car was good, thanks to Griffin Radiators, Asco Shocks, Springs, Hampy Race Cars. I mean, the car was good. I think we was good enough to make a lap up. We had somebody just get a little excited and get us in the fence. So Darrell Shellnut, he's kind of calmed down now and sort of seeing it from a little bit different perspective, but he's out of it here tonight. And now Rich Bickle will start overtaking lap traffic. The car right in front of him, Dick Anderson, back on the speedway. He pulled off earlier with some mechanical problems. He observes the wave for the move over flag. In fact, he is coming back into the center of the racetrack, so his problems are not solved. As Hondo also slowing down precipitously as leaders go by. That allows Cope to close up a little bit. This is as close as Jimmy Cope has been to Bickle, except on a restart. Jimmy Cope is there and knocking on the door. The Pinellas Park, Florida driver is looking strong now and has basically not played his hand so far in this event. Bickle, in watching his hands, because almost all of these drivers are wearing gloves, we're not seeing him saw any bees in the cockpit of that Chevrolet at all, and that is not a good sign at all for Cope. Cope says he's happier than he's ever been in the last five years being able to run in this series with a nice sponsor like Miller Genuine Draft. His car painted up very similar to that of Rusty Wallace on the Winston Cup Tour, and he is now starting to howl the rear bumper of Rich Bickle. Yeah, this year, Cope has a new car owner, Donnie McDonough, who says, I really want to do well for him. I want to do well for myself, and I want to do well for my sponsor, so I've got multiple reasons now for New viewers to late model racing, the flame show that you're seeing out of the right side of the car is strictly the exhaust pipe, and that's unspent fuel that's touching the hot exhaust pipe, igniting it. It is in no way, shape, or form a performance detriment. And Barfield now has the leader coming up on his heels. He's going to have to give up uh, the track position now as the leader goes by high on the outside. Looks like Barfield perhaps has used up his tires also. And we are at lap 155 unofficially, more than three quarters of the way through this event. 
We've had a number of cautions, but still it's been a fast race. We'll call the names and numbers of some of the drivers as the leaders overtake him. The 72 is Mike Franklin. Bickle will next be catching the Scott Walters, the 07 car. And in front of him is Rick Crawford. We're talking about drivers that are normally running up front and not at the tail end of the lead lap, and that's where they are right now. Bickle is dialed in. He's a chassis expert, has built cars that have won all over the country during the last decade. And is able to drive just about any place he wants on the speedway to, to work through the traffic. Go high, go low, doesn't really seem to matter to him. Now when somebody catches Rick Crawford and passes him, that is no small feat. Well, Crawford not having the night he had several weeks ago over at Volusia County Speedway when he won the All-Pro Opener of 1996 during Speed Weeks. 159 laps in the book. Look at Bickle. He is rim-riding around this racetrack. Jimmy Cope has relaxed his uh, aggressiveness for just a moment, waiting for Bickle to clear Crawford. If you're just joining our telecast, this is round two of the Hooters Cup Series from DeSoto Speedway in Bradenton, Florida. We've got 40 laps to go. Can Bickle hold on? Stick around and find out. We've only had one official lead change. That's when Rich Bickle took over the point from Jerry McCart. It doesn't seem that way because there's been some good action back in the pack. And uh, look at the margin now. It looks like Mr. Bickle, now that it's time to go, has punched the button. Most of the people that come to these races and actually see them in person see so many races around the racetrack, it's really hard to focus on any one particular battle. Take, for instance, Jody Ridley there. He's been putting on quite a show, especially for the Ford fans. And he is up to fifth, Jody Ridley, who had to run the last chance qualifier because he is not a good time trialer anymore, has done what we've seen him do so many times over the years. Be patient, work his way forward, take the openings when they come. He's up to fifth, and the man he'll be trying to catch next is Freddie Query, the teammate of our race leader. A lot of folks are wondering, what powers these cars? Well, they're 358 cubic inch engines, they're V8s, flat top pistons, nine to one compression ratio, 390 cubic feet per minute poly four barrel carburetor. Longevity of these motors will usually run about 1,800 laps before rebuild. 100 laps you want to replace the valve springs because you want to keep the compression in the motor. Everybody at least carries a spare horsepower rating on these motors, about 520 horsepower. This spark comes from a multiple spark discharge box called MSD. Richie Bickle, the man who's leading right now, Jimmy Cope rides in second. Dirk Stevens having an outstanding run in third. Mike Garvey rides around in fourth. And Jody Ridley, the old man of the series, hanging right in there in a position to win here this evening. And I stand corrected on overtaking the eight car, Freddie Curry. Curry was involved in an earlier incident and is a lap down. And Ridley can thank part of his strong run tonight to his body man who took that duct tape out during the mid-race break and got that right quarter panel all taped back up, not flapping in the breeze. But look at Hanson. Hanson's about, oh, 100, 125 pounds lighter than Ridley thanks to a, a various incidents tonight, but can't quite catch him and overtake him. Hanson came down here, took 23 hours to get here. I said, why did you drive all the way down here to run a race? There had to be something closer to home. He said, it's all boils down to one thing. It's called the money. And Pays another thing, well. when you say drive, Bill, you literally mean drive. Scott's got a CDL license, and he drove his own transporter down here from Wisconsin. And the margin isn't necessarily Whoa. opening up as around goes Rick Crawford. He's going to bring out the yellow flag here. Marfield goes to the high side along with Billy Bigley. Now, lap 177, Rick Crawford, the Cleveland Georgia driver. He's got a sponsor. And Hogan here's Lumber another look Cup at it, too. And there's Freddie Quarry. This is going down the backstretch. Inside of them is Hal Goodson, who's also had a long evening. And a good, solid nudge there. And there is no way that a driver can keep a race car underneath them with a tap at that point of the turn. Well, they call that weight transfer. None on the rear, all on the front, and it gets awful loose. I do want to mention the Circle, Circle Bar, who has been his longtime sponsor, along with Hogan Lumber Company, 
who came on board to help the efforts of Rick Crawford. Laps winding down here. We'll have a less than 20 in a couple of more circuits. It will be interesting to see now if Jimmy Cope will really put the pressure on the man who's leading, Rich Bickle. And if you've enjoyed what you've seen here tonight, we invite you to join us at the racetrack next Saturday night, the Peach State Speedway in Jefferson, Georgia, for round number three of this series. That's a beautiful facility in northern Georgia. And the racing there ought to be every bit as good, if not better. And uh, this one's been a pretty darn good one as the field is forming up, ready to go back to racing. The green flag will come back out, and we will have less than 20 laps to go. And if Mr. Cope has got anything for Mr. Bickle, he has to show it now. Well, Dirk Stevens is sitting back there saying, you know, I could win this race. That wouldn't be that difficult. Mike Garvey is there. Freddie Query is up there. Jody Ridley is there. It's an all-star field set to go now for a 20-lap sprint to the checkered flag and a $15,000 payoff. And an interesting top five here, too, right now as well, because Bickle crashed in the season opener. Colt had a wheel stud problem that dropped him several laps down. Dirk Stevens involved in the same crash as Bickle. Mike Garvey had a mechanical failure. The rear end went out on his car, so the top four cars weren't even around at the finish, but... The racing gods have smiled on them tonight. Those would be the four most likely candidates with a chance to win the race as Bickle gets up through the gearbox and brings us back to green once again. And already opens up a three-car length advantage on Cope. Not to put a kibosh on what could be an exciting finish, but frankly, it doesn't look like Rich Bickle is having any problems at all. Well, we've had a change in third place there as Mike Garvey has moved up, and he has drug along the car of uh, Freddie Query as they've got by Dirk Stevens. So they've picked up two positions themselves. 16 laps are remaining, and it looks like Bickle now is starting to show just how strong his forward is. And it'll be interesting to see if Mike Garvey can get close enough to Jimmy Cope to try to take second away. Garvey has moved up smartly through the field all evening long, has nary a mark on that car, and we can't say that about too many of the machines out there tonight. The time for better to advance quietly towards the front than being someone with a lot of flash, and that's what Garvey has done. He wants a top three finish. Looks like he's going to be able to get that. He's in, within sight of the leaders, and the race is far from being over. And one of the most frustrating things on a figure eight racetrack is to have to pull off into the X and the infields and sit there in your car, which you know is done for the night, and watch everybody else doing what you want to be doing. 13 laps to go. The last 10 laps of this race must be run under green. Not consecutively, but they must be under green. And I think it's no surprise to our viewers. There's a good solid tap from Query on Garvey, but he did it early enough where he didn't send Garvey up toward the fence. And Garvey does have some right front fiberglass damage on that Coors Light machine. He shoved him down the straightaway to let him know, hey, I'm here. I want to get by. I think I'm quicker than you. Also, I want the position and the money that goes with it for third place. Now, unofficially, Query is shown on the lead lap, and we'll try to confirm his actual running order before we leave the air this evening. But the battle that we are watching is up front as Culp seems to be closing just a little bit. The question is, with 11 laps to go, does he have enough time to catch him? Jimmy's starting to stand on it now. Jimmy sees a scoreboard. His spotter's probably giving him all the confidence that he can stand by saying, hey, look, you can do it. Just move on up there. There's nobody in front of you. There's no traffic you're going to run into. Get on up there. Get to the rear view mirror. Make him drive the 45. Make his race come to you. Don't worry about him. And watch the different lines these two drivers are taking. Now, going into turn three, you see a little wider arc by Bickle. And this is indeed a battle for third unofficially. We know that Mike Garvey's got it. We believe now that Query is still on the lead lap. And Query gave him a little love tap a while ago. But Garvey's able to stay just far enough ahead where that will not be a factor at this moment. But now we're getting down to the money laps. 
Now, once again, watch the different lines they take. A little shallower entrance into the turn by Jimmy Cope. And going into turn three, Bickle uh, takes a wider entry there as well. Bill, what's he trying to do? Well, I think he's trying to cover down. He's trying to carry as much speed as he possibly can all the way through the corner. One thing he doesn't want to do is scrub off some speed or check up because Jimmy Cope will be right on his rear bumper cover. He doesn't want that to happen. He realizes that he's only got one car to race with and that is the only thing that's going to separate him between him and the checkered flag. He's in a position to pick up all the marbles now. This time by two laps, two laps to go. Jimmy Cope has closed. Query has gone high and around Mike Garvey for third, but the Coors Light driver comes back on the bottom side of the speedway. Will he yield? Yes, he will. White flag this time by Rich Bickle. One more lap around the track. Cope giving it everything he has. Can he catch him? And if he can catch him, will he lay a bumper on him? The answer to both is no. And Rich Bickle wins round number two, the Hooteré 200 at DeSoto Speedway. And his teammate looks like he will claim third place. Freddie Query had a very good run there and valiantly got by Mike Garvey in the closing laps to pick up third place. But there's your winner. Rich Bickle and the terminal transport entry winning the Hooter A 200 from the Soto Speedway in Brayton, Florida, the second stop on the 1996 Hooters Cup Tour. And how do you spell dominance tonight? B-I-C-K-L-E. No doubt about it. Jerry McCart had a very strong car at the start of this race, but when Bickle decided to take the lead, he went for it right away when he saw the opening and never let go. In fact, as much as Everyone tried to catch him, most notably Jimmy Cope. There was absolutely no way. That car was by far the best one on the speedway tonight. Well, Jimmy has to take a lot of pride in his run by finishing second here, especially for his sponsors, Miller Light. He was there all evening long, doesn't have a lot of damage on his car, but a second place finish. And Freddie Query did have to battle back, and uh, he found himself at one point almost out of control on the racetrack picking up third here this evening, but his teammate going down to the victory circle. Fourth place, good run by Mike Garvey. And these are the type runs that you build points with, so in the latter part of the season, you have yourself a little cushion. And by virtue of the third place finish tonight, Query, with his second place finish at the season opener, will clearly extend his points lead in the Hooters Cup standings for the $110,000 champions payoff at the end of the season, but the story tonight is the $15,000 that will go to the man sitting at the start-finish line and the winner's circle. His name is Rich Bickle, and we'll talk with him in a moment. And welcome back to DeSoto Speedway here in Bradenton, Florida, where we've seen a pretty darn good race here tonight. Uh, Rich Bickle did his best to stink up the show. And up front, I guess maybe he did, but there were so many good battles throughout the pack that I think everybody here, and we hope you at home, are entertained by what you've seen. The Hooters Cup Series paying $500,000 at the end of the season to the series champion. It probably won't be Rich Bickle because of his truck obligations, but there will be 15,000 reasons to be real happy tonight, and Doug Rice is standing by with our winner. Once Rich Bickle got around Jerry McCart, he pretty much held on to first place. Once you got the lead, you seemed to like it up there, Rich. Yeah, this car is unbelievable. You know, I got to thank Hooters and Hatchet Fresh and uh, uh, Jack Rubar for you saw us putting the series on. You know, it's the one thing I got to say thanks to my guys. I mean, they work in the same thing. We got it off the Jake Tuesday night after getting tore up down there at Lakeland, and uh, they come back here, and they did all the work themselves, did the setup, just told them what to do, and I mean, it was incredible. And say, I'd like to say hi to Gene back home. We know he's watching. We finished one and third, and that's what we come down here to do. And uh, another couple people I got to say hi to is... Uh, Jerry, my dad up back home in Wisconsin, and everybody else is watching because tonight was, you couldn't ask for anything any better than it was tonight. Now, Rich, once you, uh, you had a pretty fierce battle there with Jerry McCart, but once he went out, you're able to hold the whole pack back. Mark Allen said, you didn't quite stink up the show. Jimmy Cope gave you a little handful there at the end, didn't he? Well, he was coming on, and he's kind of been my nemesis since we've been here in Florida since about 1983, and I knew he was going to give me a hard run. But I think I had a right front tire going down flat there the last 10 laps, started pushing worse and worse and worse, and I kept screwing rear braking, and, and uh, 
It was kind of funny at the halfway break, we had an oil pan that was cracked right down the center about 10 inches, and they said, you know, we're, no, we're done. I said, fix it. I just stick some silicone or something on it, and they did it, and the motor stayed together, and I, you know, it's about time we've had a little luck, because I've had enough bad luck the last couple of years. Rich, we saw a lot of cars come in tonight with the brake rotors just white hot on them. Was that a persistent problem for a lot of the runners? I couldn't really tell that. My car was just, I mean, it was just like in a rail, and I mean, the brakes weren't even a factor tonight. Uh, you know, the track was in great shape. The outside groove was actually better than I thought it was going to be, and uh, lap cars did a great job. And, you know, this is a great race night for us. And, of course, as Mark Allen alluded to, Rich Bickle will be running the Super Truck Series full-time this year, and he's going to be an interloper here on the Hooter Cup Series, and he's going to be trouble when he shows up. And I think we ought to put a dollar in the kitty every time we call it the Super Truck Series. Of course, the official name this year is the Craftsman Truck Series, so a dollar goes into the kitty from me. And I think the folks here at DeSoto Speedway, owner Dwayne Music and uh, general manager Patricia Bianchi, have to be pleased with the crowd that turned out here for tonight's race, round number two of the series. They're standing by for another sportsman race that uh, you may be able to see in the Prime Affiliates down the road a little bit here, the Jackaroo Sportsman Series. But right now they're enjoying the festivities in Victory Lane as the Hooters girls are enjoying the Rich Bickle festivities and let's take a look at some of that late race action there now we heard about the problems that Rich Bickle was having and Frank frankly he was I think pretty pleased it was just about over but I think uh, Mike Garvey was just about happy this was a race was starting to come to an end too. look at some of the action between himself and uh, Freddie Query for third place well here we see Mike Garvey trying to protect his position and here is Freddie Query former teacher that retired after 20 years of the Concord school system battling hard with a silver bullet <laughs> and we say hard nailed him didn't he let him know he's right well, there well he used to coach football too in the Concord school system and I think you could call that either a punt or a drop kick but no damage done there let's go back to the victory lane festivities Doug his nickname is Mr. Excitement he lived up to it tonight good second place run for you tonight Jimmy Cope thank you, you know, we had a good race car and Thanks to all the guys in the pits and my sponsor especially and dedicate this to my owner's son, Ryan. It's his birthday today. And Ryan, we'd like to win for you, but, you know, we'll take second. This team's coming together real good. It's our second race together, and we're actually, you know, I'm looking real forward to the rest of the year. You made it awfully close. You look a little bit worn out. I ain't going to say I ain't a little tired. I fought a tight, you know, tight race car off the corner, and it'll take you right out of it. You know, Freddie had the same problem I did. If they hit the wall or roll out of the throttle, so you just keep turning the wheel and keep going. So Jimmy Cope, a hard-fought second-place finish here tonight at DeSoto. Let's take it back up to Mark Allen and Bill Hennessy. Well, Jimmy Cope says, you know, I'll drive a race car however you give it to me, but I do like muscling a race car around the track. But taking a look at him there, I'm not really so sure that's the case. And we'll be back with more post-race activities, talk to some of the other stars and victims of tonight's race. Don't go away. Welcome back to round number two of the Hooters Cup Series, where Rich Bickle led the final 147 laps to take home the winner's check. Trackside handling all the hospitality of the post-race activities is Doug Rice, and Doug, what do you have for us now? Thank you, Mark. We'll be opening the ham and cheese line very shortly. It was a good night for the Terminal Trucking Team, first and third. Freddie Query brings it on third. Freddie, you said you wish this had been a 300 lapper. How come? Well, I probably was too patient the first 100 laps. You know, we had a real good race car, and we just wasn't going to try to pass anybody the first 100 laps to stay out of trouble, and uh, it worked out for us. We got a pretty good position starting the second 100 and had a good set of tires, and and everybody raced pretty clean. A lot of stuff tore up and just really had to be careful. It took me a long time to get there. But I'd like to congratulate Rich Bickle over there for winning the race. You know, Terminal Truck and Finch you... first and third. And say hi to Ron, Gene, and Bub, and all the guys at home. And uh, uh, we'll get them next time. It's been a pretty good year. You runner up at Lakeland, third place here. That ought to keep you first in points. Well, you know, that's what we're after this thing for is to win these points. And uh, you should be right. But um, we sure like to win it. But there's going to be another next week at Jeffco, and uh, we'll be after it. Hooters Cup Series, what does it mean to you? It means the opportunity to race with the best caliber racers in these kind of cars in the country, and uh, it also means the opportunity to have a chance to win a lot more money than I do doing anything else, you know, and uh, that's what I'm racing for is to make a living, and uh, that's what it means to me. And if Freddie Query keeps performing like he has been, he's going to have the opportunity to win a whole lot more money this year. Well, I think we can safely say his teammate drove lights out tonight, but uh, Query will... Uh, take the solace of the points lead to the next race and also $5,000 for finishing third tonight. 
As we take a look at the unofficial top five, we can tell you that pending post-race inspection, Rich Bickle is tonight's winner with Jimmy Cope second, Freddie Quirry third. Dirk Stevens, an excellent run in fourth, got around Mike Garvey in the late going for that spot, and uh, a very fine performance for, for a late model driver of note from the Northwest country. And the beautiful Hooters girls in attendance here at this very, very fine race. Second stop on the tour here at this great racing facility in Bradenton, Florida. Our next stop will be at Jefferson, Georgia, the Peach State Raceway. Then we move to Kenley, North Carolina. There are 18 more stops. You need to take a look at the schedule of Hooters activities coming up because, believe you me, there's going to be a race in your area. You don't want to miss it because there are races all around the racetrack. All we can show you are usually one view of it, but come to the racetrack and see the whole show. It's great. Well, the title sponsor of the Miller Rookie of the Year Challenge is also on the car of the man who finished in second place. We'll be back to take a look at some of the other ramifications of tonight's activities here at DeSoto Speedway. Don't you dare touch that dial as we've got some more interesting information for you about the Hooters Cup Series as we continue from Bradenton, Florida. Tonight's telecast is brought to you by Hooters, a delightfully tacky restaurant. By Hooter Aid, the drink that puts something back. By Jackaroo, if you ain't got Jackaroo, you ain't got Jack. By naturally fresh water, naturally fresh, naturally pure spring water. By naturally fresh foods, taste the difference. And by Red Dog Beer. And we have seen a first-rate race. This is what the best late model drivers in the country can do. And $15,000 going back through the race payout goes to Rich Bickle, tonight's winner. $7,500 to Mr. Cope in second place. Third, the $5,000. You see the payoff all the way through 10th. In fact, the payoff is in four digits all the way back through the 32nd starting position and I defy anybody anywhere in the country to have that kind of money available for a late model series. 20th place is paying more than most Saturday night features for these type cars running in excess of 100 laps. As a matter of fact, take a look at 29th and 32nd. Thousand dollars. Seventy-five thousand dollars being the total purse. The big money coming, of course, at the end of the year when the championship money is distributed. A hundred and ten thousand dollars for the winner. You take a look all the way back to 20th place. There's $12,000 for 20th place in the points. And they held a great banquet and the festivities this past January down in Atlanta, Georgia. Well, Doug Rice has done his aerobic sprints for the day to the backstretch pits to follow up further on tonight's race. Doug, what you got for us? Back down the 1995 Hooters Cup champion Mario Goslin winning the first championship may be tough enough. Winning that second one seems to be a lot tougher, Mario. Long, long night tonight. Yeah, we're having a slow start this season. I tell you what, we've you know we've been strong both races and uh, had some mishaps. You know, we got together on a lap car and when we got together, my car got up in the air on the left side and when I landed, I was trying to get you know get the car back under control and I tagged the guy that that I got together with to start with, but. Uh, I think it was a lap down, I'm not sure, but all I know is I rolled on the outside of them and, you know, I run out of room up there. We got together and then the car got sideways, got up in the air. When I landed, I went back and hit him and he went, you know, went for a ride. Can you get this car ready to go by the next time we're ready to drop the green flag next weekend? Yeah, it didn't, it didn't really hurt the car, you know. I mean, uh, we just got a flat on the left front out of the deal. When we made contact, our left front tire got cut. So uh, we had to come in and put a left front tire on. You know, of course, we're going to have to check suspension parts. We probably got a few vent pieces, but nothing major. I know that you've been disappointed with the finishes, but you got to be happy that in both races, you've had a car capable of going to the front and capable of winning. Yeah, I mean, you know, we're, we're running real well. We're happy. Budweiser car running real great. Budweiser crew doing a great job. Man, it's not like we're doing our job. We've had a real good car, just we haven't had any luck. And when we roll into Georgia next week, they'll try to throw the sophomore jinx out of the number 10 Budweiser car. Uh, Doug, we appreciate your work in the pits uh, and in the start finish line and the backstretch pits and the grandstands. Uh, Mr. Rice has been ubiquitous by every estimation. Bill Hennessy, you have been eloquent. 
and uh, I've just been verbose. Well, come on out and see one of these races. Don't want to oversell you folks, but believe you me, it sounds great, it smells great, and it is a super event. We'll see you at the next Hooters Cup race at Jefferson, Georgia. And that comes up next Saturday night, March 9th. If you're in the neighborhood, definitely stop by the Peach State Speedway. If you can't be there, check your local listings on this prime affiliate for the day and time of Hooters Cup racing. It will be round number three. So until then, this is Mark Allen for Bill Hennessy and Doug Rice saying good night from DeSoto Speedway in Bradenton, Florida, where Rich Bickle is the winner of...